Yes. Namaste and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Nepali Society for Oculoplasty Surgeons International Webinar on Eyelid Malposition. It is organized by Nepali's Society for Oculoplasty Surgeons and co-organized by Nepal Netro Jyoti Sangh, Eye Health Program, Rapti and Bahadur Ganj. It is supported by Allergan and Dynamic Electronic Medical Records. This webinar is accredited with two NMCCPD points. Uh, before we start, we would like to mention and thank the organizing team for a great team effort on today's program. Associate Professor Dr. Ben Limbu as the organizing chairperson, Dr. Ranjana Sarma as the organizing secretary, Dr. Sulakshmi Kotwal as the scientific chair, Dr. Suresh Rasaili as the scientific secretary, Dr. Suresh Rasbant and Professor Dr. Elias Rester as the scientific coordinator, Associate Professor Dr. Binita Bhatrai as the webinar coordinator, Associate Professor Dr. Koshal Shrestha as the IT coordinator, and Assistant Professor Dr. Lakshmi Devi Manandar as the CPD coordinator. I am Dr. Diksha Bista. I and Dr. Debras Bharati will be the moderator for today's program. To start with today's program, may we request Associate Professor Dr. Ben Limbu, President of Nepri Society for Oculoplasty Surgeons, to please deliver the welcome speech. Thank you. Thank you, Dikta, uh, for that. Uh, I'd like to welcome our distinguished uh, international speaker, all the way from India, Professor Abzit Ma'am, uh, uh, Professor Tayyap Afghani, sir, and also my friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Purjanto Tepo from Indonesia. So uh, similarly, I'd like to uh, welcome all other uh, NESOS uh, members, uh, the past presidents, and also the past office bearer of the NESOS um, as a whole. Apart from that, uh, I'd like to welcome all our uh, other national speakers and also uh, like to welcome all the audience uh, from different part of uh, the world. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizer, especially local organizer from the Western region, uh, Dr. Um, Sulachmi Katwal, our uh, vice president. Similarly, uh, Dr. Uh, Elia Swester uh, and all the other like uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, I know they are so instrumental to bring this webinar today. Similarly, Dr. Home and also Dr. Asis from the Eastern region helping the Western people. So welcome you all. I hope you all will enjoy another two hours with our uh, distinguished uh, speakers, lectures, and then, and then the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, the um, president of an uh, nice uh, very <coughs> warm good afternoon and namaste. Uh, now we move on for the introduction of uh, panelists for uh, today's webinar. Uh, is my slide visible? Yeah, visible. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, the first. Uh, Analyst is the mentor uh, of most of uh, young upper plastic surgeon like us uh, in Nepal. He is uh, a director for hospital services and he heads the orbit and oculoplasty department at Tirganga Institute of Ophthalmology. And he is the managing director at Drishti, the Vision Eye Center in Kathmandu. He is President for Nepal Ophthalmic Society, and he is founder president for NESUS, and he is vice president for Oculoplasty Society of South Asia, and he is former vice president for the year 2018 to 20 for Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmic, Plastic, and Reconstructive Surgery. And he was awarded by APAO the APAO Distinguished uh, Service Award in uh, 2014 in Tokyo. Uh, he's international um, master trainer for, uh, for cataract and macular plastry 
and he had 36 scientific research publications and over 50 presentations in various uh, conferences in, in Nepal and abroad. He is uh, Professor Dr. Roy Senju from Nepal. And then we move on to another panelist. Uh, she is from our neighboring country, India, from the city of Nawabs and city of Testi Kawabs from the historic uh, city of, La of Lucknow. She, she is uh, Professor Dr. Abjit Kaur, and she is an alumnus of King George um, Medical, um, Medical College, and she is, she is currently working as a professor and head of of Department of Ophthalmology and in King George Medical University. And she is in charge of in charge of oculoplasty and orbis, orbis there. And she is a reviewer of national and international journal of ophthalmology and neurology. And she has authored the clinical uh, radiological atlas of orbital disorder by JP Publications and written uh, <clears throat> various uh, chapters and oculoplasty for various books. She served as the Oculoplastic, uh, Oculoplastic Association of India, OPI, as Joint Secretary and a President, and currently she is Vice uh, President of OPSA. She is a, a qualified uh, qualified the Health and Hospital Management Exam with gold medal uh, conducted by Indira Gandhi in National Open University. And she recently in, was um, nominated to the uh, uh, Leadership Development uh, uh, Program by IIM Indore. And she has re received uh, several state level and national awards, including, um, among others, the FICO and the BK Narayan Rao Award for for the contribution to the Plasty by All India Ophthalmological Society. And another uh, panelist is uh, young, energetic, and dynam dynamic oculoplastic surgeon. He is, and he is associated uh, professor, Dr. Ben Limbu. He is consultant, Patrick and oculoplastic surgeon from Tirganga Institute of Ophthalmology, and he is president of Nessus and scientific secretary secretary at OPSA. He is chief executive officer at Global Eye Center and co co founder and executive director director at Working Vision USA. Uh, he is active. Uh, life member for 12 national, re regional, and international societies, and he has trained more than 50 eye specialists from Nepal and abroad. He volunteered three international surgical uh, eye camps, and he has authored uh, two medical books and published 24 scientific publications. He has uh, presented more than 100 uh, presentations at uh, national and international forum. And he has re received uh, several awards, including uh, prodigious Sark Academy of Ophthalmology, Oration in Subspeciality for Young Ophthalmology in 2018. And we have another panelist. He is Dr. Purjanto Tepo Utoma from Indonesia. He graduated in 1996 from um, Faculty of uh, Medicine, Universitas Gadea Mada, uh, Yogyakarta, Indonesia. And he has worked as Dr. PTT at Buru de Delmo Primary Health Center, West, West Sumba, East Nusa Tengara. And he took his uh, Residency uh, program program at ophthalmology department at at his at his alma mater in from two, 2002 
2004. Uh, he took the Aquiloplasty Fellowship Program at RS uh, Jakarta Eye Center in 2008 and Aquiloplasty Observership uh, Program at Moran Eye Center, Salt Lake City, Utah. Now he, he, work, he works at Ophthalmology Clinic, ROO Subdivision, Dr. Uh, Sarji to Hospital, Yogyakarta. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Now, moving uh, towards the next uh, panelist, we have Professor Dr. Tayab Afghani. He is involved in community eye care and he is the um, sorry, he has dedicated over three years of his life in eye care. He graduated in medicine from King Edwards Medical College, Lahore, and he did his post graduation in ophthalmology from University of Punjab. He also did a diploma in public eye health from University College London, and he's currently working in Al Sifa Trust Eye Hospital, Rawalpindi, as professor of ophthalmology and head of orbits and ochroplastic division. He is also involved in community eye care. He is also the founder editor of CIFA Journal of Ophthalmology and also reviewer of American and British Journal of Ophthalmology. He has around 50 publications in different national and international scientific journals and has presented around 60 scientific papers in different national and international conferences. He has been awarded twice, both by Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology as well as by Ophthalmological Society of Pakistan. Let's welcome Professor Dr. Tayab Afghani from Pakistan. Thank you very much. Next panelist we have is Dr. Basantara Sarma. He is from Nepal. He is the immediate past president of Nepali Society of Oculoplasty Surgeons. He is currently working as the medical director of Sri Badri Eye Center, Siddharth Nagar, Nepal. He is the former associate professor of National Academy of Medical Sciences, and he is the former. He's received numerous prestigious awards, including Distinguished Service Awards of the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. He has also been given several lectures in both international and national conferences, and he has published several research publications in different national and international peer-reviewed journals. Next panelist we have from Nepal, Dr. Suresh Rasbon. He is a cataract and ocular plastic surgeon. Currently, he is working as clinical director and health of the Department of Ocular Plastics from Geta Eye Hospital. He has received various awards, including Distinguished Service Award by Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology in 2018, Nicole Grasset NNJS Award. He has also received Prabal Janseva Sri Award for his dedicated work. Now we will move on with the presentations. On, and for that, may I request Dr. Dave to proceed forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diksha. Now, uh, now the presentation will be up 12 minutes and there will be warning in 10 minutes and three, three minutes is awarded for the commenters to comment. Uh, now, may I call upon the first uh, presenter? She is uh, Professor Dr. Ilya Shrestha, and we'll talk on the eyelid revisited. And I would like to invite Basant sir for the comment. Mm. Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Ilya Shrestha graduated from Bangladesh uh, and did Hero MD from TUTH. Mm. She did uh, her fellowship uh, in ocular plasty um, uh, from LB Prasad Eye Institute in India and ocular oncology from Willis Eye Hospital, USA. And she is an executive member of NASUS and, uh, uh, and started with ophthalmologist at Himalaya Eye Hospital Pokhara since 2007. She is now medical 
director since uh, February 2021. And she has attended uh, different uh, conferences and workshops and presented papers on various topics. And she has published uh, papers, uh, papers, papers on oculoplasty, ocular oncology, and vitroid retina. Mainly her uh, work is in seasonal hyperacute pani where it is. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll start my presentation. Today I'm entitled to talk about the anatomy and physiology of eyelid with the presenting topic, the eyelid revisit, revisited. I would like to thank all the scientific committee as well as Dr. Dev Raj Vasali for the nice introduction. Eyelids. Hello. Am I audible? Yes. My slide, okay. Um, eyelids develops from the surface ectoderm in front of the developing cornea at, at the age of, uh, it begins at the age of 18 weeks and uh, it fully develops at the age of uh, five to six months of gestation. Eyelids are divided by palpable circles into orbital and tarsal part. Both upper and eyelid meet at medial and lateral mm -hmm. canthus. Lateral canthus is in direct contact with the globe and forms the uh, 60 degree of angle when the eyelids are wide open, while the medial eyelids are rounded and it is uh, separated by lacus lacrimalis, in the center of which there is carinthal lacrimalis. Eyelid margin is divided by lacrimal papilla, which accommodates lacrimal punctum into two parts, lacrimal portion and ciliary portion. Lacrimal portion is the medial part which extends from the punctum to the medial canthus and the ciliary portion is the portion, lateral portion and uh, extends from the punctum to the lateral canthus. Ciliary portion consists of the eyelashes. Eyelashes, uh, the lifespan of eyelashes is um, around 100 to 150 days and different glands opens into the follicles of eyelashes. Skin of the eyelid is very thin and mm, elastic and it is lined by keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Subcutaneous tissue of the skin is very loose and rich in elastic fibers and is devoid of fats. Thus, it is readily, readily distended by fluid or blood. The main protractors of the eyelids are orbicularis oculi. It has different parts, orbital parts, palpable parts, which is again divided into preceptal and pretarsal portion. Mm, lacrimal part, which uh, constitutes honors muscle, which helps in the lacrimal pump mechanism. Ciliary part, which is uh, along the lid margin, constitutes violence muscles, which helps in the op uh, eyelid to remain in opposition to the probe. The contraction of the protractors leads to the closing of the eyelids and the uh, opening of the eyelids is by the lead retractors. Lead retractors cons uh, consist of both skeletal as well as smooth muscles. As a uh, skeletal muscles um, uh, in the upper lid, there is levator palpebrae superioris and in the inferior uh, eyelid, there is inferior rectus and uh, smooth muscle component of the upper eyelid is molar muscles and in the inferior there is infratarsal muscles. The mm, uh, smooth muscles component of the lead retractors are innervated by the sympathetic nerves while the skeletal muscles component are uh, supplied by the third cranial nerves. Thus the tosis is a feature of both Horner syndrome and third nerve palsy. These are the um, analogous structures like uh, inferiorectus is analogous to the levator superioris in the upper lid. Capsulopalpural fascia is analogous to the levator aponeurosis. Infratarsus muscle is analogous to the molar muscles and Lockwood ligaments or Clifford ligaments is 
um, uh, is analogous to the witness rearrangement. It is the uh, uh, at the level of uh, uh, witness and Lockwood ligaments, uh, the direction of the uh, levator parvospheris and inferior changes into the vertical direction. Arbitral septum is a multi layered fibrous structure of the eyelid which separates the eyelid from the contents of the orbital cavity. It is strong on the lateral side than on the medial side. Uh, pre aponeuritic pad of fat is a very important landmark in the eyelid surgery. Um, these are removed in the correction of the steatoid blepharon during the blepharoplasty, and uh, there are two pad of fat in the upper eyelid, while in the lower eyelid there are three pad of fat. Medial purple ligament attaches the medial end of the tarsal to the uh, lacrimal crest. It has anterior and posterior um, head. Anterior head um, or superficial head is attached to the anterior lacrimal crest, anterior to the lacrimal sac, and it divides into upper limb and lower limb, which encircles the canalicula and helps in the lacrimal pump mechanism, while the posterior head or deep head is attached to the posterior lacrimal crest to the um, posterior to the lacrimal sac. Lateral parvular ligament accesses the lateral end of the tarsal plate to the uh, orbital margin and horizontal laxity of the eyelid is usually due to the lengthening of the lateral canthal tendon. Arterial supply of the lead is mainly from the internal carotid artery as well as from the external carotid artery through the different anastomoses and the um, anastomoses and the arches which uh, uh, in the marginal and the peripheral, they form the marginal and peripheral arcades and supply the leads. And venous um, drainage of the pre tarsal um, uh, structures are drained in the ophthalmic and angular vein medially, while laterally it is superficial temporal vein, and the post tarsal vein um, structures are drained in the facial vein and the pterygoid plexus. Lymphatic drainage is mm, laterally, it is drained into the preauricular and parotid nodes, and medially, it is drained into the submandibular nodes. Sensory supply of the leads is through the ophthalmic and maxillary division of the trisiminal nerves. Uh, eyelids uh, function as a, a different function, like it reconstitutes in the tear film, maintains the integrity of the cornea, position of the globe, uh, regulates the amount of the light, provides the protection from the um, particles and co coverage of the eye during the sleep. It has different moments. Opening is by the eyelid re retractors when um, contraction of the Eyelid retractor causes opening of the eyelids. The primary eyelid retractors are levator palpebral superioris, while secondary are the molar muscles, and extra elevators are the fontanelles. Um, the, uh, opening of the eyelid begin in phase, like opening of the eye uh, uh, lower. In opening movement, lower eyelid is much slower than the upper eyelid, and it has zipper-like movement. Eyelid, upper eyelid moves vertically upwards, while the lower eyelid moves laterally in horizontal direction. Opening of the eyelid is bilateral, symmetrical, and identical in direction and amplitude, because levator of the two upper eyelids acts as yoke muscles and follow the Herring's law of equal innervation. So when there is unilateral myasthenia or unilateral congenital ptosis, lead on unaffected site is retracted in an effort to elevate the totic lead. There is reciprocal innervation pattern also exists between the levator muscles and orbicularis opuli muscle when the levator receives maximum innervation during opening um, during opening, orbicularis receives minimum innervation and vice versa. Thus, these muscles also follow the Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation. Closing is by the um, protract protractors like orbicularis opuli. That's why we have a good night's sleep in the nighttime. Blinking can be divided into voluntary and involuntary types. Involuntary blinking are further subdivided into spontaneous and reflex blinking. Spontaneous is a common form of blinking which occurs without any obvious external stimuli. Average rate of 
spontaneous blinking is 15 to 20 minutes. And the duration is 0.5 to 0.4 seconds. Uh, the blinking is present even in the blind, hence no retinal stimuli is required and there is no discontinuity of visual sensation during blinking. Uh, it has a zipper-like movement from when while closing, the, uh, uh, the uh, closing starts from the lateral canthus and towards the medial canthus, thus helps in the displacement of the tear film to the lacrimal puncta. Reflex blinking occurs due to the reflex stimulus. Uh, um, there are different reflex stimulus like corneal uh, touch causes tactile reflex, um, uh, reflex, while bright light causes dazzle uh, reflex. Sudden presence of the near object causes menace blinking reflex, and loud sound causes auditory blinking reflex, and stretching of the panorbital structure uh, leads to the blinking um, orbicular blinking reflex. Voluntary blinking and winking is a coordinated closing and opening movements of the eyelids in both eyes. Winking is a unilateral voluntary lid closure. It is facial expression and learned actively. Mi minimum period of winking are 0.3 seconds. Both voluntary winking and, bl and blinking are produced by spontaneous contraction of the palpable and orbital portion of the orbicularis. This phenomena is highly coordinated reflex between facial and oculomotor nuclei where closure of the eyelids, eyeballs are rotated upwards and outer. It is a protective mechanism. On the closure of the eyelids, all electrical activities in the levator ceases and concomitantly activity rises in the superior rectus muscle and inhibited in the inferior rectus. So the, when there is closure of the eyelids, the um, eyeball rotates upwards and out, outwards. Bell's phenomena is not present in 10% of the helix portion, so its absence is not necessarily the sign of disease. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry for joining late. Uh, can anybody, uh, everybody hear me, please? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ilya, for that uh, uh, very excellent and comprehensive presentation. I think there's not much that we can add to here, except that I would like to uh, just uh, be, uh, like to specify that these are points not just for the surgeon. And I think uh, these are points that have to be remembered before doing surgery. Uh, I would like to stress the fact that uh, all these, uh, a lot of these, uh, the anatomical and the physiological factors, when you are sitting with your patients and discussing, because a lot of the uh, uh, eyelid malpositions, one of the uh, uh, end results is uh, also, uh, you have to get a fine cosmetic result. And, a lot of times it is uh, not possible to get an absolute natural uh, uh, outcome for whatever you are doing, like whether it's uh, closest surgery or whether it's tumor extension, or whatever kind of surgery uh, you are doing in the lids. You know, it, uh, it's very difficult to get the exact natural position or natural look, uh, but a lot can be done uh, by explaining. So it becomes very imperative these days that uh, all these anatomical factors, like, you know, whether it's uh, Herring's law or whether it's physiological binkling, uh, or lag of thalmos, these all have to be explained to the patient. So I think that's all I would like to add. Otherwise, it's a very comprehensive pre presentation. Everything is available in uh, online and on textbooks. You can go through it. But all I would like to stress is make it a habit of uh, talking with the patients regarding the certain anatomical and physiological aspects of your uh, surgical procedures also. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we are running we are short of time right now. So I think I would request the host to please uh, continue with the next topic. And if there are any more questions, we'll be willing to answer in the, at the end of the, uh, uh, during the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Ilya. And sorry Thank for you. being late. No problem, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Shrestha, for the wonderful and excellent uh, presentation. And, uh, 
and Basant sir for the comments. Mm. Now, I'd like uh, to request all the mm, participants to write the queries, if any, in the chat box, and we'll discuss uh, at the last of the presentations. Now, uh, may I call upon second uh, uh, presenter? He is a professor, Dr. Tayyab Afghani from Pakistan. Uh, we have already introduced uh, him, and uh, and he will talk on sling um, materials in Toshis. And I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Abjit Kaurman for the comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I can, I'm heard, uh, I'm audible. Yes, sir. Okay, so I will be talking about the, uh, just let me uh, just uh, make some uh, adjustments and uh, in, a while, in a while I will start. Okay, I will be talking about different materials for uh, sling surgery. And uh, this is one of the uh, commonest, the TOS is one of the commonest procedures which we are doing that. It's very important that we should know that uh, this, uh, we should be using the best material which suits the patients, both cosmetically and for patients' uh, real rehabilitation as well. So, uh, it, and it should not uh, recur and the reducing the likelihood of recurrent tosis, and of course, avoid, it avoids the risks and the discomforts of additional surgery. <clears throat> the effectiveness and rehabilitation of the surgery may have cosmetic implications to the patient. Tosis surgery is under development for almost uh, 100 years and is still under refinement, and sling surgery is a commonest procedure. Dozens of materials have been in use, which is the most, and which is the most cost effective. I think it cannot be determined. Different types of uh, materials which I looked into the literature and what we have been using from uh, the last 25 years, uh, it is, uh, I mean, these are 10 materials which I can think of. Autogenous facial atta, palmaris longus fascia, temporal fascia, and banked facial atta, sclera, Gore-Tex, proline, silk, mercelin, nylon, uh, which includes supramed and supramed extra, etc. And uh, what is the ideal? I don't think the ideal is actually the one which does not cause any recurrence. There is no infection, there is no granuloma, there is no slippage, and it is stretchable and doesn't cause lid lag, and it is affordable and it is for all ages. Is it does it exist? I don't think it, it does exist. So first of all, we talk a little bit about the autogenous facial data, which is uh, actually the most desirable material currently gold standard. And uh, it is it got a low rate of complications such as infection, extrusion, and breakage in granuloma formation. However, it is not as suitable in children under three years of age where it's not fully, it's difficult to harvest in infants and the possibility of permanent thigh scars makes it an unattractive choice. And it, of course, there is a need for a second surgical site to harvest the fascia. Uh, it may cause a catricial contracture of the upper eyelid, which cannot be easily repaired. However, it still remains the gold, gold standard so far. Palmaris longus tendon is good for children. This is the location of the palmaris longus. And it is uh, uh, the most commonly used tendon graft in orthopedics. It can be safely harvested through small incisions two in CNs of one centimeter apart, and it is completely developed at birth because it has got a higher tensile strength than an equal portion of facial atta, and it's densely arranged connective tissue fibers. It is considered as a living suture. So it's good uh, and uh, for the children. Banked facial atta is irradiated or lyophilized and allogenic is an alternative sling material. 
And however, early resorption may lead to higher rate of recurrence and fibrous transformation may result in band that is difficult to revise. Across infectious disease is another problem. Gotex or expanded polytetrafluoroethylene or in brief e, PTFE is also one of the, as a good material which is in use. And uh, it is a synthetic microporous polymer comprised of uh, nodules interconnected by multidirectional minute fibers. It is most effective material for frontalis suspension surgery and it is some consider it to be uh, the recurrence rate is almost nil up to 15%. However, it's porous nature, one thing. It results in proliferation of bacterial contamination resulting in a high risk of soft tissue complications. And however, the micropores are too small to allow infiltration of fibro fibrovascular tissues so that they can be easily removed and manipulated to adjust the eyelid height. The fibrovascular tissue is strong enough to maintain a sufficient eyelid height even after removal of the material. Silicon rod tube currently very popular all over, I think in the in subcontinent and I, I have, we have also been using the last 10 years or more. Some call it the least, however, some call it the least successful, but it depends on how, do, uh, what are your results. Uh, it does not integrate with the fibrovascular tissue and may therefore uh, result in recurrence, which may be up to 50% in some of the series. As for complications, lack of cell mass and herniation have been frequently reported. The most valuable advantage of the silicon rod is its elasticity and adjustability, which allows complete eyelid closure and adjustment uh, uh, to, for the appropriate upper eyelid height. The silicon rod may therefore be best appropriate for patients with poor Bell's phenomena, like myosin and gravis, third now palsy, CPEO. Uh, silicon rod sling reduces the use of artificial tears and lubricants in these patients. Marcin mesh has been in use in the past, most likely, but I don't think anyone is using at the moment, but this is just uh, is a, a still a part of the uh, armamentarium for sling. In doses. It is made of a polyester fiber manufactured by machine knotting process and the mesh acts as a permanent scaffold supporting uh, fibrovascular end growth, thereby reducing the risk of slippage and providing a long lasting upper eyelid height. However, other studies reveal relatively higher incidence of sling extrusion uh, and granuloma formation. In fact, we used to use it. Uh, about a couple of years back, 10, 15 years back, and we were not very much satisfied. And, and so we have actually uh, almost given it up. Now, the proline, nylon, silk, these are, these are is also one of some of the sling materials. Uh, proline is, is quite popular, it's a synthetic, non absorbable monofilament and readily available, inexpensive, easy to handle. Minimal tissue reaction, low risk of inducing granulation formation when required can be easily removed without significant scarring. However, mixed results are there in terms of recurrence, high to low. Uh, may break, produce visible suture tension lines, which is a very it's a common uh, problem. Uh, visible suture tension lines and deformity of the eyelid marker. So comparison of sling materials from different studies, which I have just, I'm not really given here the reference, but you can easily find the reference. There are multiple references. Uh, autogenous facial data remains at the top, which very low recurrence rate and almost no infection and no other complications. Uh, banked facial data has got very high recurrence rate because it resolved, tends to resolve. And it has got, of course, there is a risk of infection as well. Polyfilament nylon is a high recurrence rate. Infection is also there is a problem. Mercine mesh has all the problems. Recurrence rate is high, infection rate is high. Gotex has got also a recurrence rate of 20%, and, but a relatively lower infection rate. And of course, uh, uh, silicon rod, which we're talking about has, has, in this, these studies, which have come across 23% recurrence rate no infection or granuloma, and uh, otherwise uh, it has got a good record. 
proline recurrence rate is again our comparable to silicon infection rate is still there and so these are some of the uh, available comparison details for uh, the choice of, of facial atlas length. Uh, what is uh, just uh, looking at this scenario uh, at these uh, analysis, at this analysis, we can suggest algorithm for sling materials. We can divide uh, into three groups, the, child, the patients, group A, all patients with congenital process above three years of age, regardless of the, uh, the amount of the, the uh, efficiency of the elevator. And group B is children below three years of age. And group C is all patients with poor bells like CPE or myasthenia, gravis, and third nerve palsy, et cetera. So group A, where the, all patients with congenital doses above three years of age, regardless of the uh, function of the elevator, we will go, well, actually, uh, it says something I have, uh, just to, to make you clear that I am a great proponent of the levator resection and even in the poor levator, uh, poor levator. So, but uh, we are talking here of sling materials. That's why I'm talking in that reference. So, all patients in group A with congenital process above three, three years of age will have auto, uh, autogenous facial data remains the top choice followed by silicon rod in Gotex. And group B is children since in children facial data is not available. Uh, properly. So, Palmeiras longus is a good suture. Silicon rod is again is a good choice. And proline also can be used because it can be easily removed afterwards when we revise and when we opt for a better options in the later part of the child's life. Group C is all patients with poor film because of adjustability and uh, flexibility. Silicon, remade, uh, silicon rod remains a very good choice. So, in summary, for the last 100 years, we are in search of ideal sling. Autogenous facial data is best option so far. Uh, synthetic materials are more readily available and are not associated with donor site mobility or cross infections. And, but however, the synthetics have high recurrence rate with high risk of extrusion, infection, glioma formation, and breakage after trauma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Afghani, for that very elaborate and well-researched talk. Uh, basically, I would just summarize by saying that the two major requirements for any material which is to be used for a sling is that it has to be inert, it has to be biocompatible, and it has to have a longevity. So on these three accounts, primarily the autologous tissues, most often the fascia lata, and the silicon do the best. With regard to the propensity of infection, I have a little reservation, although different people have their own opinions. Infection, I feel, is not a problem of the material. See, a material mm. can cause an inflammation. It cannot cause an infection. So if we are talking of infection, we need to look at the handling of the material and the handling of the tissue. So on that account, I don't think we as surgeons can blame a material for infection. We have to look at some other cause. Personally, um, whatever little experience I have, my first choice in, is now bending towards the silicon because the acceptability by the body, the ease of doing the procedure, and the avoidance of a donor site morbidity is all taken care of. With the changing trends in society, nobody likes scars of any sort. As far as palmaris longus is concerned, yes, the orthopedicians do use it a lot, but I have never had any experience with uh, harvesting a palmaris longus uh, tendon. So all in all, I think our sling materials majorly boil down to the autologous fascia lata and the uh, synthetic sling. Others, I think, are slowly fading out. They are more from historical and literature point of view that it's important. Lag of thalmos, again, I feel has a lot to do with how much tightening has been done 
and how much how deep you are in the plane also the visibility on the lid is an indication that you are in the supra orbicularis plane you have to be sub orbicularis your sling will not show you know when you look down if there is a cord like thing that is visible it means there is inappropriate tightening and the plane at which the structure is passing through your sling is passing through that is inappropriate that's from my side thank you so much thank you dr professor abdid i think uh, i go along with your uh, uh, decisions and your judgment you are right and uh, and uh, i mean i think there is no point in argument over that thank you very much thank you sir uh, for the wonderful and beautiful uh, presentation and thank you ma'am for the comments now uh, we move on to another uh, presentations uh, may i invite uh may i invite also chat a uh, professor dr kushal shrestha uh he will talk on safety and efficacy of open versus closed technique of frontal swing surgery and i will invite may i invite dr purjan totepo for the comment uh, uh also chat a uh, professor uh Uh, Dr. Kosal Shrestha graduated from Saint Saint Petersburg State um, Medical Academy and postgraduate from Namsville Hospital. Uh, he did uh, fellowship from Arvind Eye Hospital, India, and observership uh, at Kashi Eye Institute, USA. Uh, starting with uh, general ophthalmology, he worked as local plastic surgeon at Alumni Eye Institute for nine years, and and at uh, present he he is at Universal College of of Medical Science and Minakshi Eye Center at Bhairava. He has uh, participated in various conferences and workshops. He has. <coughs> numerous uh, presentations <coughs> at peer reviewed journals thank you dr dev uh, namaste uh, and uh, good evening respected seniors uh, guests from neighboring countries and dear colleagues i am feeling very happy to be here in this great uh, oculoplasty webinar eyelid malposition uh, now i am going to talk about the safety and efficacy of open versus closed method of frontal sling surgery for the ptosis with poor levator action. Okay, ptosis denotes the drooping of upper eyelid, mainly upper eyelid, of it is of various etiologies and of varying degree, and it may be unilateral or bilateral. And uh, uh, ptosis does not yeah. cause only functional disability, but your yes, your presentation is not visible. Not visible. N not visible for all. Yeah. Yes, doctor. You need to do a slide. So, slides. Uh, you are at the middle. So please start from the beginning. Uh, okay. Now. Okay. See. I request for remote control. Please grant me. You can go to the down button and then uh, go to the slides. So, Doctor Kosal. Slides. So, okay. So, slides, so, down. Can you stop here and read? Uh, read. <coughs> uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Share your screen. Okay, and then you go to the presentation mode. Screen. Screen. Yes. Yes. Now visible. Yeah. yeah. Visible. Then. Please go. Asa Ali. Asa Dayas. Yes. Oh. Oh. Okay. From Thank you. First time. Okay. Okay. 
Today's topic is safety and efficacy of open versus closed method of frontal sling surgery for ptosis with poor levator action. Okay, ptosis means to fall, which denotes the drooping of basically upper eyelid, and it is of various etiologies and of varying degree, and it can be unilateral or bilateral. And ptosis does not only cause functional disability, but it causes cosmetic deformity and people perceived, it is perceived by people as less intelligent and more negatively as compared to the uh, uncorrected and corrected uh, ptosis. And ptosis conditions with poor liver action presented in our clinic were mostly simple congenital ptosis and uh, process with Marcus gone jaw winking phenomenon, which is a kind of a type of synkinetic ptosis due to the abnormal aberrant connection between the uh, trigeminal nerve, branch of trigeminal nerve, which supplies the external pterygoid and the branch of oculomotor nerve, which supplies the levator muscle. And also we got the ptosis in case of third nerve palsy and in ocular myasthenia. And <clears throat> we had few cases of uh, ptosis associated with oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. Uh, yeah, and actually these two patients are brother and sisters and there are other cousins and sisters uh, which, uh, who had the same problem. Uh, and uh, uh, this also is not uncommon blepharophimosis syndrome we had in our uh, study period. And frontal sling is the choice of, of uh, operative procedure for severe ptosis with poor or absent liver to function, which works by connecting the eyelid to the brow with a sling material by utilizing the power of frontalis muscle to elevate the poorly functioning eyelid. The study was carried on uh, Lumini Eye Institute and Research Center as a prospective randomized interventional study for two years duration. And we included unilateral or bilateral moderate to severe eyelid ptosis with poor or absent levator function. And of all etiologies, and we include all age group. And we started our evaluation, preoperative evaluation with palpebral fissurite, marginal reflex distance, and of course, levator function test, and other ancillary tests like extraocular movement, corneal sensitivity, Bell's phenomenon, summer test, slit time examination, and sometimes if need, tensilin test and ice pack test, and photographs. And surgical procedure were carried on under general or local anesthesia uh, with the single uh, Fox Pentagon loop technique and open and uh, close method with using uh, 0.78 millimeter silicon rod. In case of closed method, Fox Pentagon was marked. The two uh, pre-tarsal skin, skin is done uh, 8 to 10 millimeter apart, three to four millimeter above the eyelashes was marked and two brow incision made and a sing, uh, forehead incision approximately one centimeter above the brow were made. And silicon rod was passed along the mark and retrieved through the forehead incision and passed through the sleep. And it is not, uh, uh, we didn't make any knot and it is buried uh, in, inside the forehead incision and closed with and closed with uh, six zero vicryl. And uh, for the children who underwent surgery under general anesthesia, we put thrust suture overnight to prevent the coronal exposure. And in case of open uh, method, we made a crease incision and dissect the orbicularis and uh, make the uh, 
find out the interior surface of the tarsal plate. Then we fix the sealing material with the six zero pro lens suture at two point six eight to ten millimeter apart. Then, uh, as like in uh, uh, close method, we pass the rod along with the uh, mark pentagon mark and retrap through the uh, supra orbital uh, forehead uh, incision. Then again, we passed both the ends through the slit without making knot. Then first we make the crease suture. We applied the crease suture before uh, before uh, re -adjust, uh, adjustment of the eyelid uh, crease or eyelid height. So after this uh, making this uh, crease suture, we uh, adjusted the height and make the contour uh, as much as beautiful. Then we buried this uh, uh, slip under the forehead incision and uh, close the forehead incision with for bicryl suture. And post-operative evaluation included uh, height of the lid, contour, uh, crease, whether crease is present or not, and symmetry between the two eyes, and complication, if any. Uh, there were 95 patients with 121 eyelids, uh, eyelids and uh, the minimum age of the patients were, was one year, and, and the oldest patient was 70 years, and number of male patients was little a uh, bit more than female, and 90% of the patients fall under the 30 years of age. And the most common type of ptosis we operated were simple congenital ptosis, followed by blepharophimosis syndrome, traumatic ptosis, ocular myasthenia, oculopharyngeal myotonic dystrophy, Marcos gone ptosis and thorn of palsy, and one case was of unknown etiology. And uh, there are there are two uh, among two methods of surgery that the distribution is equal in both the group. And satisfactory result we defined as a uh, two to four millimeter of ma uh, margin reflect distance one, and. <clears throat> And we found we found overall uh, seventy nine percent satisfactory result, seventy nine percent satisfactory result. And if we look uh, method wise, there is eighty percent in closed method and seventy eight percent in open method. We got the satisfactory outcome. And and symmetry. If we see the symmetry. Uh, of the eyelids, uh, there are uh, there was uh, symmetry. Seventy one percent symmetry we found in open group and seventy six percent in closed group, closed method method group. And uh, if we see the lid crease, uh, pre presence of lid crease after surgery, there are uh, lid crease present in 75% in open uh, technique and only 53% uh, in closed technique, which is uh, statistically significant. And uh, among uh, complications, uh, we had uh, um, work under correction was the most common complication, which was which occurred in 22%, uh, 22 patients, which is 18% of the patients had under correction, out of those patients, eight patients were happy with what we could do. They don't need any uh, additional uh, intervention. And one patient we uh, leave observation. And uh, we planned ceiling adjustment for seven patients who, unfortunately, they didn't come back again. Two and remaining. we readjusted. Uh, uh, one time sling readjustment in three patients, and uh, and likely uh, there are two patients with sling ptosis, 
one uh, was uh, improved with increased one revision and one with lost follow up and for in uh, forehead one infection was managed with local in, uh, intervention and likely la lack of thalamus and corneal ulcer were, were treated with local medication uh, sling removal and uh, sling removal after multiple readjustment try and ultimately removal and forehead swelling and pain were patients were not happy so sling was removed and other uh, minor uh, complications like this marcus gone uh, residual marcus gone jaw winking phenomenon double lid crease notching yeah. <clears throat> on corrected uh, under correction with plateau or intropion just uh, observation and what we see is we divided success rate into functional and uh, cosmetic uh, both the functional and cosmetic uh, result were, were good in our uh, study and uh, and all previous studies so overall success rate of more than uh, 50% to 100% however there uh, in our study the follow up period is less as compared to the previous studies and elisa galindo found poor eyelid crease in closed method group similar to our study it may be due to unpredictable location of the sling on tarsus in the closed method technique and also it may be due to the incision being placed below the eyelid crease and the crease being not reformed at the end of surgery conversely is a good lid crease we could see in our open technique is maybe due to crease formation at the end of the surgery and uh, we had exposure to keratopathy in four cases, which is similar to the result mentioned by Carey and Carter SR. Uh, we removed sling in three cases of closed method group. In one case of keratopathy in open method, we managed it with topical medication. And despite of direct visualization and fixation of sling onto the tarsus, lastosis is observed in initial few cases in open group. Uh, we think it is maybe due to learning curve because we see this problem in initial cases. Uh, it, yeah. And it may be due to position of the silicon rod on tarsus close to the eyelid margin. And one case of uh, granuloma and uh, infection, wound infection and exposure of the uh, silicon uh, material, we uh, we, uh, we, uh, we had to remove the silicon rod. So uh, follow-up time is shorter in our study and not uniform for all the patients. It is because of uh, due to, it may be due to uh, positive or negative effect on the noted success rate. Because if patients are satisfied, happy, they don't want to go again to hospital. If they are frustrated, they are not happy, they don't they also that time also they don't want to go hospital again they don't they, do, they don't they think it will be same if you go to the hospital again and photography is not available for all the patients it's our it's our uh, weakness so uh, silicon rod remains the reasonable material of choice for frontal sling for ptosis with poor levator action it may be due to easy availability can be easily revised or replaced in comparison to another materials. It is a safe choice in patients at high risk of cardiopathy as we can reverse the procedure if uh, anything uh, happen uh, beyond our uh, aim or if, if there is a problem with severe cardiopathy, we can just remove the sealing material. And functional outcome is very similar between open and closed method of frontal sling. But however, open method is superior in terms of crease formation, which is much important in, especially in young patients. So here are some pictures uh, in, during our studies. So these are the uh, comparison between pre-op and post-operative uh, photos. 
pre-operative photo, first post-operative day, and then after one month, this is the girl with pre-op, and this is post-operative photo, and this pre-op, and post-op right eye. And this is the case of blepharophimus syndrome. And after correction, single stage uh, blepharophimus syndrome uh, correction, then it looks like this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kosal Sresta, for the uh, nice presentation. It's very, uh, very nice. Uh, it's uh, very comprehensive. You give uh, the, you present your uh, study about uh, Doses with proliferator action, and then you compare uh, uh, between open and closed technique for this uh, surgery. Uh, and from the the result, I uh, we can see that uh, the symmetrical it's 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 comparable between the two the two uh, method and the uh, and the function it's. Uh, comparable between two methods, but in, in the cosmetic uh, cosmetic uh, methods, it, it's, it's different between the open and the, the uh, closed method. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's, it's comparable between two of them, actually. It's, uh, uh, what is it? It is a, a preferential of the surgeon wants to do the with uh, open or closed method uh, i myself i uh, usually do the dosis surgery with uh, open method because i i what is it? i found uh, a better cosmetic in that uh, in in that case because every patient usually they want to have a good uh, appearance they want to have a, a good look and uh, and for other consideration is uh, they are afraid to do it in the local anesthesia but if the, the patient is uh, capable to do it in the local anesthesia it's it's all right and 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 for the Documentation. I I agree that we have to do pre-op and post-op, and sometimes we can uh, use it for the objective uh, uh, objective uh, tool to measure the the uh, the parameter parameter that we want to to compare between the two using the the photographs. It it, it is uh, the objective. Parameter, I think, uh, and and for the the complication and for the complication, it's it depend on the handling of the of the material itself because uh, the complication usually uh, because of the uh, our handling to the the uh, material that uh, is not good or uh, not. Uh, 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 proper to to the uh, material. I think that's uh, my point of view, Dr. Kosal. And uh, once again, uh, congratulations uh, for your uh, study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kosal. Thank you, Dr. Kosal, for the wonderful presentation, and thank you, Dr. Puzanto, for your valuable comments. A gentle reminder to all of you, if you have any questions regarding any presentations, please do write in the chat box so that we can discuss it in the uh, panel discussion at the end. Thank you, Dr. Koshal, once again.
Now the next presentation is by Dr. Purzanto Tepo Utomo. We have already introduced him as our panelist. He would be talking about maximizing entropy and surgery. I would request our panelist, Professor Dr. Rui Sayusa, for commenting on his presentation. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to the committee for inviting me here. Uh, this evening, I would like to talk about maximizing entropy on surgery. Uh, I have no financial interest in this presentation. And we know that involutional entropy is in what rotation of the eyelid margin and most commonly affect the lower eyelid. The prevalence rate among elderly population is about 2.1%. Uh, and uh, since the entropion can cause corneal scarring, so it, it is uh, uh, important to, to manage properly. And the clinical features, the symptoms of the uh, uh, Entropion is foreign body sensation, and then sometimes patients complain about the irritation, persistent red eye, and also tearing. And from the sign, we can see that in turn eyelid margin, and there's a horizontal eyelid laxity of riding preceptal orbicularis. Sometimes we see the conjunctival injection, and sometimes ulceration and panus formation. Uh, superficial, superficial punctate keratitis and also uh, trichiasis. The causative factors of involutional entropion, uh, it's a vertical laxity of the lower eyelid. The, the vertical laxity uh, mainly result from attenuation or dehiscency from the levator eyelid retractor from the lower tarsus. And also the horizontal laxity of lower eyelid Lucent tarsus and cantal structures are the major causes of horizontal laxity of the lower eyelid. And the overriding of the preceptal orbicularis oculi muscle to the pretarsal secondary to laxity of the lower eyelid retractor. This may increase the backward force for inward rotation of the lower eyelid. And also there is involutional changes in the tarsus. There is degeneration and fragmentation of collagen and elastic fibers reduction in the number of meibomian glands in the elder people lead to excessive horizontal laxity of the lower eyelid. And this is the, the, the tarsus, there's moderate to severe degree of degeneration. And also in the conjunctiva, we find a subacute inflammatory cell uh, infiltration. Another causative factors are in what uh, upper eyelid, eyelid push, where the eyelid mark uh, where the upper eyelid margin of right on the vertical leg lower eyelid margin during eyelid closure produces high pressure due to contraction of the ocular oculi muscle. Another factor is or orbital fat protrusion, positional relationship between the globe and lower eyelid. And uh, we can say that these three factors are vicious circle, ocular irritation, cause the reflective reflexive blepharospasm, reflexive blepharospasm cause the inward rotation of the eyelid margin and inward rotation of the eyelid margin uh, cause the ocular irritation and it uh, can uh, cause one another. In managing this involutionary entropion, we have to consider the factors that produce the condition, hope for the best result. But Still, the problems in the entropion surgery is the high recurrence rate. And so we have to find the best surgery method. How to maximize the entropion surgery? First, I think it's the technique has to address causality factors. We can correct, uh, make a correction of the vertical laxity or correction of the horizontal laxity. And the prevention of the ocular also, uh, oculi muscle of writing, we can, uh, one technique is a waste procedure, 
with the full thickness transverse eyelid split to create eyelid scar to prevent the preceptal ocular or oculi muscle of riding. But it says it has a recurrence rate 10.6 percent until uh, 26 percent. And uh, but still, uh, the combination method is better than single method. A single method only correct one causative factors, and it's a high. Uh, have a high recurrence recurrences and the combined procedure correct two or more causative factors this is lowering the recurrences rate and uh, we can also consider uh, the approach of the surgery whether it's transconjunctival or transcutaneous approach for transconjunctival approach there's a recurrence rate three uh, percent and uh, uh, there will be a cicatrical entropion cause lower eyelid retraction. And for the transcutan, uh, there's a recurrence rate uh, 0% until 4%, and it's create the more significant anterior lamella scar. Uh, study by Kakisaki et al. Uh, show that uh, the single method compare with the uh, combined method is different in the matter of the recur recurrence rate. The single method uh, usually have a high recurrence rate and the uh, combined method have a, a lower recurrence rate. And uh, for the surgical approach, the subciliary and the transconjunctival, it uh, has a as a better result in the uh, subsidiary result for the matter of the recurrence rate. And this uh, summar, uh, summary for this presentation that uh, we have to make, we have to identify what are the causative factors and to, to perform the combination surgery technique to address the cause in order to, to have a Max, to have a maximum uh, entropy and surgery result. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Tivo, how are you? I'm fine. Doctor. Good to see you. And I'm glad that I've been in your university, Gajamada in Yogyakarta. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for a very nice presentation. And you have elaborated very well the etiopathogenic conditions which should be tackled during the correction of involutional entropion. And I again re-emphasize that what you are going to deal should be in the mind first before you put the sutures on your patient. So just again emphasize that the etiopathological factors for involutional entropians are horizontal lead laxity, vertical lead laxity due to descents or disinsertion of the retractor, and overriding of preceptal auricularis and pretarsal on top of that. Other factors are also associated there, like tarsal thinning by the senile changes and orbital fat atrophy, which can also cause the inophthalmos of the globe, making the little bit component for the involutional entropion. As there are many publications on the single versus combined procedures for the involutional ptosis, uh, not intro, entropion, sorry. So we should tackle each and every etiopathic factor. So if you see there is a horizontal lead laxity, the WISP procedure cannot give the proper correction. So you have to tighten the lead and you have to correct the dehiscence or disinsertion of the retractor by doing the Jones or Wiss procedure. And at the same time, prevent the overriding the pre septal and pretarsal muscle by putting the lead averting sutures or quicker sutures. So combined procedure is always better. It is with high success rate and low recurrence. It is already proven by the many studies. And uh, 
I saw in one of the slides that zone procedure has better uh, results in compared to the WISE because I think in zones procedure, the suture taking the bite on the tarsus and then come out of the auricularis and the skin beneath the lashes. So there is a dealing with the tarsus making the lead stability and there is a less chance of recurrence. As in the WISE, there is no taking any bite on the tarsus directly. Low retractor combined with the suture taking the bite and the auricularis and the skin. That's why WISE is less promising and there is a high chance of recurrence. So these are the things I would like to uh, just mention on your presentation. Otherwise, everything is so fine, elaborated and informative as you have mentioned in your presentation. Thank you very much. Sorry Thank for you. my camera. I couldn't come in, in front of you, but there is my picture to just remind who I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Thank you, Dr. Purjanto, for that well-informative presentation. And thank you, Dr. Rohit Saiju, for the comments. Now, moving on to our another presentation. We have, doc, we have Assistant uh, Professor Dr. Lakshmi Devi Manandar. Uh, after completing her post-graduation from National Academy for Medical Sciences, she joined Palpa Lions Eye Hospital. She did her fellowship in orbit and oculoplasty from Lumbini Eye Institute and Research Center. And she is currently working in Lumbini Eye Institute and Research Center, Sri Ranambika Saha Eye Hospital, as an ophthalmologist and an oculoplastic surgeon. She has attended and presented in many conferences at national and international level. Uh, also, may, Ms. Hutt, the topic of our presentation is modified V's versus Jones procedure for senile entropion. And also, may I request our panelist, Associate Professor Dr. Ben Limbo, to comment on her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diksha, for a nice uh, introduction. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So good evening all. Uh, the topic for today's presentation is WIS proce modified WIS procedure versus Jones procedure for intropen correction. So I have no financial disclosures to make. <coughs> Lower eyelid entropen is commonly acquired eyelid malposition affecting aging population. It may cause foreign body sensation, tearing, ocular irritation, corneal ulcer, resulting in sight loss, and it may even cause eye loss. So the surgical therapy is considered as the treatment of choice, which has shown positive impact on the quality of life. Several surgeries have been described to correct involutional entropy of lower eyelid. However, recurrences have been uh, frequent with many of these techniques. Because of the multifactor nature of the disease, no entirely best surgical technique has yet, been, yet been reported. So, a prospective study after the ethical approval from Lumini Eye Institute and Research Center was carried out in the Department of Oculoplasty for the duration of one year from 2019 to 2020. All the patients with, with senile entropy of lower eyelid were enrolled in the study, and it was further subdivided into Group A and Group B and it was random, randomly divided. So group A, uh, it include all the patient, all the eyelids undergoing modified WIS procedure, whereas group B includes uh, those eyelids undergoing Jones procedure. So those patient who had upper eyelid entropy, who has cicatricial entropy, uh, were excluded from the study. Similarly, patient with previous lower eyelid surgery and those patients who were not willing to come for follow-up were also excluded from the study. So the entropion of grading of entropion was done with the following methods. In grade one, if the only posterior lead border is enrolled, in grade two, if in turning of intermarginal strip, grade three, if whole of the lead margin, including anterior border, is it done. So coming to the surgical technique. So 
uh, first local anesthetics was administered, then a traction suture with 40 cells was applied. Then lower lid was inverted with the help of Jago's spatula and a horizontal incision was made through conjunctiva and the lower lid retractors, thus inferior to the lower tarsal border. Then the length of the incision was titrated according to the extent of the intervene and the incision is not extending beyond the lower punctum. And uh, then uh, the sutures are passed first through the uh, skin, then anterior border of the tarsal plate, then conjunctiva retractor complex, and then it is again way reverted back to lie in the uh, skin just uh, below the last line. The three sutures were passed, medial, central, and lateral sutures. Then they were tied to correct of the interval. So next we have is the zones procedure. So here also to start off with, the local anesthetics to the entire length of the lid, then horizontal incision around, uh, horizontal incision is given uh, around four millimeter away from the last line. Then the orbicularis muscle was dissected. Skin and orbicularis is reflected to expose the tarsal plate. Then hemostasis was achieved. Then the lower lid retractors are uh, dissected and separated from the lower tarsal border and the conjunctiva. Three plicating sutures were applied with 6 0 vicryl for skin, then lower lid retractors, then lower border of the tarsal plate, and then skin. Skin. So here uh, we can uh, close the skin either in single setting or uh, in the same setting like we did in this uh, surgery. Then the sutures were tied up to correct the entropy. So suture removal was done from day seven to uh, two weeks, depending upon the need in both the procedures. Patients were evaluated in first and two weeks post-operative day. Subsequent follow-up visits were done at three months. And in each follow-up visit, patients were uh, evaluated on primary position and also on the, in the down gaze position. And uh, patients were also asked to squeeze their eyelids closed to evaluate any latent recurrences. Surgical success was defined as complete resolution of the inward rotation of eyelid margin and the symptoms. The outcome measures uh, were successful surgery, that is normal position of eyelid at rest, and the recurrence and complications like overcorrection. So uh, we have some, uh, here we have uh, photographs. Uh, um, the first is the uh, WIS procedure. So this is a 70 year old lady uh, who had lower eyelid entropin, senile entropin. So this is a uh, post-operative photographs of first post-operative day or who underwent which procedure. And this is a photographs of the, that same lady 
after the suture removal and put in post-operative So similarly, we have a 75 years old man uh, with lower lid entropin who underwent Jones procedure. So this is the uh, photograph of first post-operative day. And uh, this is a photograph of put in post-operative day after suture removal. So coming to results, so total 64 eyelids of 59 patients were enrolled in the study. And so this is a uh, table that is showing the study the clinical variables of the study eyelid in both the groups. So here we can see that the mean is uh, of presentation in group A is 70.5 years, whereas in group B, it is 67 years. Uh, the difference uh, between these two groups with regard to age and sex is not statistically significant. So similarly, this is a table showing uh, the distribution of the patients according to the rating of intropion uh, between the two groups. Here we can see that the majority of the patients they, in both the groups, they have grade 3 intropion, but it is not statistically significant as the p-value is more than 0.05. So again, this is a table showing um, the coronal status of operated eyes in both the groups. Uh, here we can see in both the, group, both the groups, uh, majority of the patient had uh, only corneal SPKs, that is superficial punctuate keratopathies. Uh, and uh, the cornea is clear in 10% in group A, whereas it is clear, it was clear in 15% in group B. And the epithelial defect was found in 3% in group A, and epithelial defect is slightly more uh, of around 7.8% in group B. So we did not encounter any uh, major intraoperative complications uh, in uh, both the groups except uh, bleeding in eight eyelids. Uh, there was no major uh, post-operative complications too, however, one patient who underwent modified WIS procedure, uh, he presented with bleeding after one week and he was managed with cauterization of the bleeding vessel. Coming to the post-operative outcome comparison between the two groups. Uh, so here we can see on first post-operative day, the surgical success in group A, uh, that is in modified WIS procedure was 94% percent, whereas it was uh, around 96.8% uh, in group B. And uh, at three months uh, of follow-up period, the surgical success in uh, group B, that is in uh, zones procedure, it, uh, is around, it is 100%, whereas it was uh, around 94% in group A. And the complications like overcorrection, undercorrection, it was present only in group A, that is in modified WIS group, which was absent in group B. So at three months follow up case, one case in modified WIS group had recurrence because uh, of spastic component along with the involutional component too. So she was managed with injection botulinum toxin. So to conclude, surgical success is slightly greater after the Jones procedure than the modified WIS procedure. However, the complications rates were slightly higher in case of WIS procedure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Lakshmi, for such a wonderful presentation with uh, uh, video demonstrations for the surgical procedure that you have done in uh, your institute. Uh, I must congratulate for uh, such a wonderful uh, study on entropion. Uh, however, entropion, senile entropion mostly occurs in the lower eyelid. And then the various reasons have been already uh, mentioned by other speakers like uh, dehiscence or disinsertion of lower lid retractor, especially capsulopapillophasia that detach from those that can ultimately lead to loosening or the, it usually holds, capsular palpable fascia holds the tarsal plate, which is a major support to the eyelid. If it leaves like capsular palpable fascia, give away the lower border of the tarsus, that means tarsus can easily evert or invert. Now it depends if the external force is more it will evert outward. But if the internal factors like congenitiva, scarring, 
that easily can lead to entropion. So having said that, that is one of the most common cause for the entropion, lower lead retractor, that is vertical dehiscence. The other one is horizontal lead laxity. That is the other major cause for entropion. So horizontal lead laxity are usually not addressed by the Wies or Jones procedure because it is horizontal lead laxity. It has to be addressed by tightening the horizontal lead either by doing lateral tarsal strip procedure or by pentagonal excision of the eyelid with direct closure can actually tighten the horizontal lead. Apart from this, fat atrophy, significant fat atrophy in the old age can lead to enophthalmos and that can again lead to entropion that needs to be addressed at the same time. And then similarly, the skin gets loosened with the age that leads to loose performance of external factor that can lead to internalization of the eyelid margin and entropy. So what I mean to say here is, when you get a senile entropy, you really have to assess whether the patient has horizontal lead laxity by doing horizontal lead laxity test or snapback test, and then assess whether this patient has really horizontal lead laxity or not. Similarly, to see the vertical laxity, you need to see the eyelid excursion. So to do that, you need to ask the patient to look at primary gaze and look down and now see how much eyelid moves down along with the eyeball. If the eyelid doesn't move along, with, along the eyeball when looking down gaze, that means it has poor lead excursion. That means it definitely has some component of inferior retractor dehiscence or disinsertion. So you have to decide whether the patient has horizontal or vertical lead laxity before choosing your surgery. That's what I will advise to your team, Lakshmi, uh, when you get a senile entropy uh, rather than just choosing between. And regarding a two surgery, one is just aborting surgery. Uh, the which surgery is aborting surgery and then that will not last longer in our experience. If you see the patient over the period of time like 12 months and 24 months, they give up. Most of the time they give up. Aborting suture will give up with time, will, they will decay. And I will definitely suggest if you are doing a single procedure for lead retractors, then I will suggest joint procedure is definitely better than the which procedure as Professor Rohit Sanju has uh, stated that uh, the Jones procedure should be better in compared to which procedure when you choose a one from this. But when you talk about big like whole senile entropy, you have to assess and judge whether this is horizontal or vertical. And if you are in Delima, I suggest you to do both the procedure go with the horizontal lead tightening as well as a vertical suture, eboting suture or the Jones procedure together will definitely give a better results in long term after the entropy and surgery. And that's what I do nowadays. I do routinely vertical as well as horizontal tightening for all the patients. But it was a good presentation, good talk by Lakshmi. I'm proud of, I'm proud of you and your institute doing so good in the eastern part now. Uh, congratulations to the entire team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manandar, for the wonderful presentation, and also Dr. Ben for his comments. Thank you. Now, moving on to our next presentation, may I request Professor Dr. Abjit Kaur with her presentation on cicatricial and ectropian. We have introduced Dr. Kaur as our panelist, and uh, may I request Professor Dr. Tayab Afghani to comment on her presentation. Thank you. At the outset, it's been such a lovely evening listening to such lovely talks, and I really enjoy and feel heartened when such young, vibrant, uh, the family is growing. The, the, it's becoming so good to see so many young ophthalmologists taking up oculoplasty. It's like a dream fulfilled. Coming to my topic of cicatricial ectropion, it is slightly different from all the other 
positional abnormalities of the eyelids because here we have an extra component of a cicatrix, something which is not normal to the lid. And that is why before going into the depth of the procedures and the analysis, I would take two minutes and go down to, uh, this slide is not moving. Can you see my slide? Can you see yes. my slide? Yes, ma'am. But it's not moving. Spam. Uh, the slide is not moving. Yeah, it's, it's, it's now next slide. Okay, You're on next fair, enough, fair enough. So basically, I'll take three slides to dwell upon what a scar is. A scar is that part of the normal skin, which is replaced by fibrous tissue. And there are some features of an ideal scar. It should be thin, flat. The color should match the surrounding tissue. It should be oriented along the relaxed skin tension lines and it should not cause any distortion. To develop a scar, there, there are phases of healing, only then a scar forms. So there is an inflammatory phase, there is a proliferative phase and there is a maturation phase. It is most important not to start operating in the inflammatory and proliferative phase. So let the wound heal. If you are dealing with cicatricial ectropion, let the wound heal. Let all the redness die down. That means you should at least wait for 24 days. Maturation will continue for two years, but till you see that the redness has finished, pain has gone, there is no local swelling, only then put your knife to the patient. Now you see this is a burn scar in this lady here. All this redness here, not in the exposed part, but in the upper part. This is all very red. It is painful. So don't start operating in this phase. On the other hand, you see this child, this scar is well healed. This is fit for your procedure now. And image, how do you identify when the scar is ready for surgery or not? So immature scar is raised. It is erythematous, rigid. This is a very important thing. You must always run your finger over the scar and it is painful. And these, they are always at a risk of developing hypertrophic um, hypertrophy in them. So a mature scar does not undergo any further changes in morphology. There's something wrong with this. again got stuck. We are on pathopsychology. Okay. Slide. So now, concept. Yeah. What is a scar? What is an ectropion basically? There is a differential length between the anterior lamella and the posterior lamella. So when the anterior lamella is shorter than the posterior lamella, that is where you get an ectropion. And scarring or shortening of the anterior lamella will obviously pull the lid outwards. Etiology are varied. There is trauma, burns, cicatrix from skin tumors. There are drugs like dorzolamide, brimonidine, is commonly used amongst the glaucoma patients. There are skin conditions like ichthyosis and allergies. Cicatricial ectropion can be graded. Just like entropion, ectropion also has a grading. So it's grade one where there is punctal eversion, grade two where the whole length is everted, grade three where your palpable conjunctiva is visible, and grade four where the fornix is also visible. So these are the different grades of ectropion. Why do we need to address these patients? They have both functional and cosmetic concerns. And their functional concerns, believe you, they are very major. There is epiphora, there is redness, there is foreign body sensation. There is diminution of vision from the corneal involvement. And there's an inability to close the eye adequately. Cosmesis, of course, is a very, very major factor. And you can see how terrible these scars look. Look at this baby with an ectropion and look at the way his eye is red. 
and he just can't close his eyes. So he's got a corneal involvement, this old man from burns, there's another lady from trauma, another child. So once they are with you, you need to assess before surgery, what are you going to do? And your assessment needs to note the stage of maturation, the type of the scar, whether it is linear, oval, or irregular, the grade and the extent, and whether there are any other lid abnormalities associated with it or not, and any comorbidities. Is it post-radiation? Does he have an underlying plate? Is if it is post-traumatic? So also in the closed position, you see the patient in the primary position, and then you see the patient with the eye closed. You see how this eye does not close. This is an anophthalmic socket. There is an ectropion, but you see the scar, it is puckered to the orbital margin. That means there is a fracture here in which this tissue has in got incarcerated. Again here, you see this vertical scar, it has caused a coloboma and an ectropion, but it is fixed here. Another case, this is of an animal bite. Look at this, total ectropion, but you see the inferior cornea is called a corneal opacity. Here, there is an ectropion, but there is a keratoblepharon here. Look at this, this patient is obviously infected. This is post-traumatic. So in your assessment, you need to address all these issues. Once you are sure that your patient is ready to be treated by you, you need to first see how fresh or how old is he. Can you do something before actually putting your knife? So is there a primary prevention? So yes, there are certain methods in which when a patient of an injury, any mode of injury comes to you, you can modulate the wound. In the, this is in the early traumatic, post-traumatic period. So I'll just run you through a few things which I personally use. Scar massage, I'm a big fan of mas scar massage. Topical uh, steroid ointment, anti, you massage anti to the length of the um, scar. So this should be done at least two to three times a day six, for about six to eight weeks. And actually what this does it is mechanically stretches and disrupts the fibrous tissue which is being formed. I picked this hint up from the plastic surgeons. Something wrong with my laptop today. So these are the different directions in which you can do your massage. If it is a diffuse scar, you do a circular massage or you can do a vertical massage, depending upon which direction you are seeing the pull coming to. Silicon gel. Now, silicon gel is a hydrating substance. You cover your wound in the initial period. So it helps to decrease the capillary activity, vascularity, and metabolism of the scar tissue. And it results in reduced collagen deposition. This again picked it up from the plastic surgeons who deal the, with burn wounds. Intralesional steroids. I personally have not used much of intralesional steroids, but it is reported that they are anti-angiogenic and have an effect on the um, wound. Hyaluronic acid, again, it is a filler. We all know it. It acts, it has a dual action. It pulls, lifts the eyelid from its neutral position and also causes mechanical stretching. And fat also has been uh, thought to be a autologous fat also has been used as a um, promising new role instead of a hyaluronic acid, although personally I have never used it. Amniotic agents, yes. 5-fluorouracil, I have used this. 
and found it very useful for those patients where the scar is very extensive, like in road, tra road traffic accidents. Now, how do you decide on a plan for surgery? See, all those were preventive in their role. But when you do have a patient, surgery is our sheet anchor. But before taking up for surgery, all other factors should be addressed. This one has to remember. Options, different options we have. If there is just a minimal ectropion, you can do an enhanced tarsal strip. If the tarsal strip does not work, you do a Z-plasty or a VY-plasty or a W-plasty for linear scars, an S-plasty for oval scars, and you can do a skin graft or an advancement flap for wider irregular scars. So these are just diagrammatic representations. I know all of you know the full detail of these different procedures. Donor site is another issue which is important to address when dealing with cicatricial ectropion. The donor site for full thickness, actually the eyelid is the best site. But why don't we use the eyelid? Because it causes um, deformity in the other eye. So we don't like to use it. And also there is a limitation of the amount of skin that we can take. So the common donor areas are the post auricular area, the supraclavicular area, and the inner side of the upper arm. And choice of the donor site will depend upon the patient's age, the size of the graft that is required, and the presence of the graft in the donor, uh, present of any scar in the donor site. So for your donor site, once you have prepared the recipient bed, you need you, this white thing that you are seeing here. This is the template made up of paper, blotting paper. So just put it on the retro auricular area, mark with gentian violet or a marker pen. I also like to mark it with, you see these small red dots. I infiltrate the whole line because then that again gives me a double mark so that if my gentian violet gets removed, I still have a mark to stand by. The depth of the dissection has to be till the subcutaneous tissue, don't take any fat. And if by mistake there is fat, then you wrap this graft on your finger, take a Westcott scissor and defat the graft, put it in a moist, moist bowl of saline. These are diagrammatic representations. Remember, that you have to break all the adhesions. If you will not release it, so you do some amount of subcutaneous dissection. And once you have applied your graft, you see these red stabs that I have drawn. These are small incisions which allow the blood and serum to ooze out. You apply traction sutures in the opposite direction. This is about how to stitch a graft. So let's go through some of my patient, uh, patients from the King George Medical University at Lucknow where I work and I invite you all to please come over. It's a lovely place in a beautiful town. This patient, I used five FU. You see, this is how the patient came. This was after two weeks of five FU, you see the amount of palpebral closure. And here you see with massage and five FU, there has been so much of wound modulation, but this was very early into the injury. This is yet another lady. You see we done, did a post-auricular graft work. This amount of lengthening is there. You release all the skin. You tighten it by what is called the modified lateral tarsal, and then you put in the graft here. Another patient, you see this post-auricular area is so well healed, right? And this page, entire rough area you see from here, and it gets beautifully opposed. Now, this is a very interesting patient. He had an injury, and he came to us almost six weeks after his injury with the sutures intact, because he had been in coma all that while. So this is the cicatrix that we got, and we removed all these sutures, of course, reopened this entire thing, but there was a lot of scarring. All the scarring was removed and a W procedure was done. W plus T was done for this patient. It's given a fairly good cosmetic result. Yet another patient, you see this massive scar with this 
eversion and prolapse of tissue. All this was excised. You can see this retro, huge piece of post auricular graft, which we had harvested from here. And this is the nice position he has got after surgery. Now, this is a child who developed miliary tuberculosis. And this was a discharging sinus. For one and a half years, she was on antitubercular treatment. Finally, this is how she resulted. And you can see for her upper lid ectropion, we harvested her from her forehead. You see the scar going up here. This is the harvest from the forehead. Rotated it, applied it here like a flap, and closed this as primary closure. This child is now seven years old, doing well. This is actually not an tropian, but I take this opportunity to bring about this case because this child was born with prolapse of fornices, which is actually in the true sense, not an ectropian, but still, I just felt like you pushing this here because this is a very rare condition where this child was born. All we needed to do was evert the eyelid, bandage the eyes for three days, and this was the thing without any surgery. All this edema fluid got absorbed and the baby was absolutely fine. This is yet another child of perinatal sepsis with multiple uh, pyogenic necrotic areas of both upper lids. And after management, this is where we had reached. Finally, this child was lost to follow up. And yet another baby of necrotizing fasciitis. You see the amount of lid tissue that has been destroyed and the large scar. Beautiful graft given over here and nice palpable aperture symmetry. And yes, she has a little lag, but well, that was all we could do. There's yet another lady who came with this terrible scar, total dystopia, canalicular rupture. And this was almost a one year repeated procedures where I could finally get her to this position. Other patient of some sort of a drug-induced necrolysis where he had lost part of his upper lid and part of the lower lid on the left side. This is after the first stage of the upper lid that ectropion was dealt. We put in a graft here. This is pending. Another patient with bilateral cicatricial ectropion. You see how badly the fornices are scarred, everted. Our lid is scarred and the entire fornix is averted. So we have managed to just treat the upper lid when the person who did a vitriolage on him came and finally shot him. So we lost this patient. This is a post-traumatic encephalocele. You see you, this patient has a encephalomalacia. Multiple fractures of the orbit, dystopia of the orbit, and this huge um, gap along with ectropion of the lid. We still haven't, with, I, why I'm presenting this patient is that we still haven't been able to treat this patient. We are just doing a tarsoraphy from him because he's comorbid. So what is the take back? The take back is that ectropion is both cosmetically and functioning, very, very disabling. Early wound treatment has a positive impact, but the surgical procedure ultimately needs to be customized to every patient. Meticulous planning and execution needs to be done and follow up for the need of a revision is very, very important. Thank you all for your patient hearing. And I thank the organizers for this lovely opportunity to being with everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Professor Abjit. I think it was a nice, uh, it was very good uh, coverage of all the <coughs> sorry aspects of the psychiatricial ectropion, right from the definition of scar, its stages, and then <coughs> excuse me, and then then the sign. Then of course it is very important that when to start correcting the, and then there are <coughs> sorry, I am sorry, and then you also talked about. Uh, some of the preventive measures, massage, and then, and these are some of the alternative methods, of course, and they do work. And our in our setup, especially in subcontinent, we also use some oils along with that, and instead of creams and all that. So these do work. 
and at the end of the, uh, I mean, the last part of your lecture was uh, around the the management through surgery, and uh, I really I think the all the uh, beginners and the those who are interested in acupuncture they should learn. I mean, they should remember these staging of the uh, ectropion and also follow the principles which you have laid down for treatment of in the different stages of the ectropion. And the, the pictures which showed of your pic, I mean, they are some, I mean, they just look like as if they are from my region as well. I mean, one thing is really... Uh, India I, I Pakistan, want... actually, there was only a political divide. There is no other divide. <laughs> yes, of course, we have got the same uh, issues and problems and yeah. all that health yeah. priorities, education, etc. So one uh, thing which was, uh, I mean, I, I want to add for your interest of the, I mean, especially the read, uh, the rest of the participants is that we have a series of patients where the females with uh, epilepsy, epilepsy, the moment they enter in the kitchen, I mean, at times the fire induces epileptic attack and they fell. They, you know, they fall on the stove and this bilateral up, all four led, leads psychiatric ectopnean and fortunately the cornea is all right. So that is another, we have a series of such cases. And then of course, acid burns you know, to the ladies. I don't know how far it's common in your area, it but is. we have special, we, you know that it, uh, one of our, you know, the producers in Pakistan, they got, she got an award, uh, you know, Oscar award for uh, stating the, I mean, the state of affairs of these acid victims. That's another cause of the, as you mentioned also. So I think it's, it's good that we should uh, determine the, the time at which we should do. And of course, we should uh, take into account the post-operative management of with after full thickness graft. And of course, the technique is very important. Otherwise, even ectopion will either make come back or it may be undercorrected. Thank you very much indeed. I, I really you. learned a lot from your uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Abjit Kaur for that well-informative presentation. And also thanks to Professor Dr. Tayyab Afghani so for his comments. Now, moving on, um, I would hand over to Associate Professor Dr. Binita Bhattrai for a panel discussion session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dicha. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dicha. And thank you, everyone, for such an informative and uh, pretty things what we could learn. This two, two hours was uh, full of learning, but still there are a few questions that need to be answered so that we can learn more. Uh, first question is... Uh, Regarding the sling material, uh, as young ophthalmologists see, uh, it is the silicon material is being used more. So we, uh, the art of harvesting fascia lata is not learned by the young oculoplastic surgeon. So what are your suggestions regarding fascia lata sling to young oculoplastic surgeon? Uh, oh, Vinita, may I take this question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Thank sir. you, Vinita. Thank you. Uh, you are fortunate that you don't have to harvest fascia lata. In our times, the era of the silicon rod is freely oh. available in our areas. Hundreds of cases I have done frontal sling with fascia lata. And we had very nice instrument called striper. Uh, there are two types of striper basically in practice. One is the mostly the round tubular one and another is a tougher stripers. With a single cut at the thigh, we harvest fascia lata very nicely, make the four stripes and five actually, one for the reserve. If something happened with the, the, the proposed one, then two stripes used in each, making the double triangle Crawford sling surgery. And I did this for uh, about five to six years. And once the auto sling is available in the India and Nepal, then the fascia harvesting procedure has stopped because the outcome with the fascia lata and silicon rod is almost same. And it is a single stage procedure. 
Whereas in the fascia lata, there are wound in the thigh, you have to put the additional, take care of that wound, making the, you know, that crepe bandage putting. And second days, the patient came for a stosis surgery, but he became the little bit lamb, you know, the abnormal get. And then they take out the stitches after 10 days like that. So young, it is good to learn the techniques, but nowadays fascia lata harvesting is very less because of the easily available, affordable, uh, this uh, artificial material, silicon rod is available. That's good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And a few other questions like, uh, when to operate on recent or is in ptosis, automatic ptosis, like should we wait for six weeks or should we wait for six months was the other question that was raised. Can I answer this question? Yes, ma'am, please. See, for traumatic ptosis, the first thing is that you need to know why is the lid totic? Is it neurogenic or is it an impact on the LPS or is there a hematoma? So once you have identified the cause, only then go in for surgery. That's point one. Point two is even if there is any amount of impact and inflammation, six weeks is a good time to wait. During the six weeks, you get a fair indication that is the ptosis improving or is it status quo? If it is status quo, then there is obviously more than just an inflammatory cause, right? Yes. So that will help you decide then if it is a third nerve, post-traumatic third nerve. So are the strocular muscles in what? What is their status? So in any, this question of how much to wait, it, this question is, should not be addressed as a question. It should be addressed as an etiology based question. That after trauma, why is it that the patient has developed ptosis? Is it because of a blowout fracture? So every ptosis does not mean that the LPS per se is involved. It could be something else. So you need to first zero down upon what is the reason for the ptosis. See the course of the ptosis. And then decide whether you need to wait or you can go ahead with your surgery. Thank you, ma'am. And the other question was, which is better option, LPS resection or LPS advancement? Resection or advancement? Uh, this is a personal choice of the surgeon. Procedurally, yeah. procedurally, till identifying the LPS, they both have a scar. You need to dissect in the same way. So it is only once you open up that you will find whether it is disinserted or has it gone back or you need to tighten it, right? Or is there a foreign body sitting there which actually just got covered in the healing of the skin? So many times you find a small foreign body sitting there. In road traffic accidents, it gets into the, through the brow. It sits under the... Um, under the um, fat and it causes mechanical doses and all along it's only when you see that you've opened it up that there is some sort of pressure this alignment is not right and then you try and see for a little further deeper dissection you identify that there is a wooden chip or a small um, tarmac um, material lying there so again it would depend upon how much, um, what is the condition of the LPS aponeurosis on table? Suppose it has been a through and through cut. You need to identify and put it back. Thank you, ma'am. When would you like to take it, Rohit? Would you like to take it? No, I'm totally agreed with you that it is upon the surgeon's preference and choice. And both have the equally good results. The main thing is technically should be done very correctly. And the last question for Tosis was... Yeah. Yes. I want to add here one thing. Yes, the only reason I resect the levator is sometime when the levator is too excess, 
that cause bulging on the eyelid. If you have advanced the levator and it is causing bulging on the over the skin, if you think that it's too much bulky, then definitely I excise otherwise. Definitely, uh, the, I agree with uh, Professor uh, Ma'am, Abjit Ma'am, and also Dr. Sanju that uh, it's a surgeon's preference. Thank you, sir. And the last question for Tosis was, like, what is the best procedure to correct Tosis with Marcus Gunn jaw winking? Like, how do we completely neutralize the Marcus Gunn jaw winking? So in case of Marcus Gunn jaw winking, we have to talk, talk to the patients. It's not a simple Tosis. It's not just a tosis, okay? It's a Marcus gun and then tosis. You have to tell the patient that despite of your surgery, you may have some residual Marcus gun jaw winking phenomenon. But to address that and to minimize that, uh, what I personally advise is to excise the liberator here so high as to whatever the amount you can so that it doesn't come back and adhere itself to levator or the other tissue and then cause Marcus Gonzo winking. And then definitely the, the rest of the procedure is same. You have to do as like open procedure of the tosis management with this link. Yeah, uh, I, I have just addition on the Dr. Bain's uh, statement that uh, you need to do extirpation of levator aponeurosis, not only the cut, you go dissect high up, up to the quitinous ligament and give the lateral horn incision. Otherwise, there is a residual um, jaw winking phenomenon. And if you leave that tissue there, it will give some attachment to the surrounding. And then that will give some amount of jaw winking in the coming days. That's why you have to extrude a complete excision, go high up to the quitinous with giving the lateral horn incision complete and take out that completely and do the sling surgery. So this is the best choice, but it all depends on the how you have discussion with the parents of the patient because small amount of jaw winking is still tolerable, acceptable. If this is a high enough, definitely it is cosmetically blemished and to be corrected. Wow. Thank you so much, sir. So now moving on to other section, like there are questions regarding entropian. So there was a question like, which is the best surgery to do with, deal with the recurrence in entropion? Like you did one procedure and there is recurrence. So what is the best option we go for the recurrent entropion? It depends on the what type of entropion, like Dr. Abjit Kaur has emphasized, go to the etiopathological base. What type of entropion that is? If it is the cicatricial entropion, there is no point of doing the horizontal heat laxity correction. If this question is for the involutional entropion. The combined procedure is the best. The many publication has proven that combines with the correction for the horizontal lead laxity, vertical lead laxity, and also everting suture, which correct the overriding mm -hmm. of preceptal to the pretarsal, what is the one of the major component for the involutional entropion. I think the combined procedure is the best for the recurrent involutional. Entropian. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So when you get a case of recurrent entropian, you have to make sure, you have to make sure that there is no much congenital scarring. Because while we see a case of recurrent entropian, we see a lot of uh, you know, congenital scarring inside. And if you don't address that part, that is different in Titi now when it uh, when it comes with the congenital scarring in a recurrent entropion. So how to actually know whether this is a cicatrical or not? You have to just pull back the eyelid, see the lead margin, leave it for there. And if it doesn't go inside, if it doesn't roll inside without a bling, then that must be just a senile entropion. But if it immediately enroll after you leap back, then that must be a cicatrical component also. So you have to really assess if the patient has a cicatrical, intro, a cicatrical component in patients with recurrent. If that is the case, then definitely I will advise to take ipsilateral or contralateral tarsal conjunctiva and then put that to address uh, apart from the lead laxity or whatever the situation of the patient. Thank you, sir. And the other question was, uh, what will be the option if ectropion occurred after intropion surgery? 
if there is atrophin after the entropian surgery, that most likely cause would be either horizontal lead laxity, or if you have done over excision of the skin while addressing the pre-septal orbicularis ride, overriding the pre-tarsal. Uh, so if it is, uh, if you think that anterior lamella is scarring and that is causing uh, the atrophin, then definitely you have to again, go back to uh, Professor Abjit uh, called MAM surgery, and then probably you have to, again, try with the medical therapy, massage, and if that, that doesn't work, then definitely skin graft is the answer for that. But if you think that there is no anterior lamellar scarring, it's more because of the laxicity, because as I said initially, the whole eyelid is stabilized with the tarsus. So if the tarsus get more laxicity, if the tarsus is like free, and if it has some component pulling outward, then it causes atrophy. So the simple answer is just do a lateral tarsal strip procedure that works both for atrophy and entropy if there is no anterior lamellar scarring. It is, uh, is there any duration like we can wait to see if the atrophy goes back, like mild atrophy? Uh, it won't go back. It won't go back. Yeah. Okay, let me just, uh, I would like just like to add to what... Uh, Dr. Ben said, most of the times I've seen where ectropion occurs in cases of uh, senile entro entropion is, as he said, not addressing the fact that there was horizontal lid laxicity. So, and what, what happens is most of these cases are done where there's horizontal lid laxicity and you do a V's type of procedure. I've seen that there you get an overcorrection with this thing, uh, ectropion. So I think, as he said, so please, uh, you have to address the pathophysiology of the senile entropion and just doing a BLTR type or a VS type of procedure for all kinds of entropion, especially low lid. Usually it doesn't happen. It's in the low lid that you'll get this ectropion after entropion surgery. So I think the most common cause is doing a VS type or a BLTR procedure with, uh, in a senile entropion who has horizontal lid laxity. And because you're not addressing the main this thing issue here. So I think that is the main cause. And I think uh, we should take it. Uh, I think we are doing a lot of these type of procedure in senile entropy. I think you have to change that and actually do the procedure which addresses the pathophysiology of the entropy. And just don't do blindly BLTR or VS procedure in the lower lids. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And there is a question just popped out. Okay. Like Didn't I wait a minute? I think Abhijit ma'am want to add something. Yes, ma'am. Basically, whenever there is a either a recurrence of the same or it's gone in the other direction, that means the force that was supposed to pull it back into position has not taken place. Fundamentally, that's the reason. And most often than not, as Ben said, the lateral tarsal slip really, really works very well. It somehow anchors the whole tarsal plate, pulls it along. But while doing the lateral tarsal slip, there's only one small tweak that one we need to remember is the medial punctal position. Don't pull it so much, don't tighten it so much that your medial punctal position gets altered. Then again, you get into trouble with an enrolling of the margin. That's the only tweak. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And there is a last question, like just, um, uh, if we uh, we started doing ptosis and there is fat infiltration in LPS while you open the LPS advancement for LPS advancement, uh, should we change it to silicon rod or should we stick to the plan of LPS advancement? This is a question. Uh, Binita, I think uh, I will answer on this question. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't see the answer. Uh, I'm audible. Yes, sir, you are. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, if there is a fatty infiltration in levator aponeurosis, that is basically congenital. In the congenital ptosis, the anatomical landmark is altered, and levator aponeurosis is mostly infiltrated with fat. And before you decide which procedure is best for your patients, so what is the levator function? You know, if levator function is poor or fail, it's better to go for frontal sling surgery. If levator is more than seven, then levator advancement or resection is a choice. In my opinion, 
Fatty infiltrative levator is mostly in the congenital ptosis, you will find that. And may I take a minute just to make a small uh, words? Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate Nessus for making this wonderful webinar and Dr. Bain and his team, mostly my colleagues from Western part of Nepal, Dr. Suresh, Dr. Sulachmi, Dr. Suresh Panta, uh, Dr. Binita, Dicha, and all the team. And I would like to congratulate all the speakers for wonderful talks and making a time for Nessus by the, our invited speakers, Professor Abjit, Professor Tayab, my friend Dr. Tipo, to being with us. And I hope that all of talk make a little bit more knowledge in our head, which will be useful, fruitful, and beautiful in the coming days in our octoplastic practice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Tayab, do you want to add something on that question regarding the fat uh, visibility during the surgery and then uh, how to proceed? Well, I have uh, come across uh, this situation uh, occasionally. And I have uh, stuck to my original plan of elevator resection. And most of the times, yes, and it has worked. So uh, very rarely I have gone back to the sling, to reverting back to sling. But uh, I am a great fan of uh, elevator resection, even in poor elevator function or absent elevator function. And I have got acceptable results after that. I think I will, I will still say that if you are able to identify the levator properly, that's the most important thing. Whether it is uh, fatty or whether it is fibrous, whether it's muscular, you have to identify it. Whether uh, sometimes you, you, I mean, it's not, it is, this is a steep learning curve to identify the levator properly. So if you are able to identify and isolate it properly, then you can resect it. I think it will give you promising results. Thank you, Professor. Uh, and the same question to uh, what is your experience uh, from uh, Indonesia, Dr. Uh, Tepo? Would you like to add? So what is your experience when you do a levator surgery uh, for ptosis and then if you get a fat on levator, would you uh, continue with your surgery like levator resection or you uh, change your plan to uh, a sling? If uh, I do the those the surgery and then the the fat was pop up just no, like no, that fat is replaced you know fat has replaced the levator okay i changed my plan to to the frontal sling because uh uh if i uh i'm not sure that if i uh, continue with that method it, it will give a best result so i prefer to change my method to the frontal sling Okay, thank you. Um, opposite man, what do we do <laughs> when you get such a situation? Normally, the type of patients we see, even in congenital ptosis, fat is not a major problem. In our demographic type, fat is not a major problem in the congenital lid also, congenital ptosis also. So I would say that I've never really faced a situation where there is so much fatty infiltration that I need to rethink. So I just go along with whatever initial plan I had. If it, if initially also I had decided to do a sling, I go with a sling. If it was like seven mm or something, and I was doing a resection, I continue with doing a resection. The fat infiltration has never made me change my pre-surgical decision. I agree with you, ma'am. Because uh, what I, my, I now I would like to share my experience. So what I do when I see a fat infiltration in a uh, levator. So this was the question. So basically when you have already done a pre-operative -eva uh, pre evaluation and you found that the levator action is, has some fear to moderate action. And then if you see a fat infiltration, it doesn't really should change your surgery, I think. Because you know that the levator function is already good. And there are surgeons who prefer to do even in the poor levator function. They still do levator resection. They do supramaximal, they do into the witness. The only problem with those surgery is lack of thalamus. Patient will still have lack of thalamus despite of having 
good say is a outcome and But a little yeah. fear and a little fear of a superior fornix prolapse in so, supra maximal there is this chance that you may get a, a fornicial prolapse true true ma'am so and then i think uh, the importance here is to identify a levator is very crucial sometime in the young patients the orbital septum is so thick and it mimics like a levator so be aware that you are not dealing with the orbital septum thinking this is a levator you know so you need to see the fat the other answer is you need to see the pre operatory fat pad but sometime not sometime i have seen one patient recently done uh, levator section in congenital ptosis i found the fat was beneath beneath the levator not above the levator but beneath i am going i have a captured video for that patient i was capturing in my video for my surgery and then uh, accidentally i found that the fat was beneath the levator sometimes that can happen so sometimes the anomaly position of the fat can also misguide our surgery that's what i thought so but so yes at that point i'll just make an insinuation that whenever you identify any sheet like structure which you think that this is the levator you must always pull it a little and see if it is cord like stretching you know it is the septum because the lps goes inside and pulling that sheet will not cause a cord like feeling if pulling that sheet and palpating over it gives you a cord like feeling that is a hint that you have caught hold of the septum true ma'am and in septum if you hold the septum and then if you ask the patient to look up there is no movement but if you hold the if you hold the levator and then ask the patient to look up definitely you'll get a strong uh, opposition uh, force into the levator or into your forceps that's another way of exactly locating the levator so to summarize i think pre operative evaluation should decide what kind of surgery we are going to proceed in such situations thank you very much for the discussion it was wonderful discussion i think uh, i should... just have a question mm -hmm. here i thought the question was whether to do an advancement or uh, continue with the lps or whether to do an advancement uh, of the levator or to this thing uh, uh, okay. or do a levator formal re levator resection was that the question initially So no. the question okay. was like, if we will continue with the levator advancement, or we will shift to the frontal sling silicone rod. Okay, okay, fine. I thought it was oh, okay. So this were all the questions that were raised, and for those who are interested, Dr. Rohit uh, Sir and Dr. Bain Sir and Home, Dr. Home has also um, uh, answered few of the questions in the chat box. You can go back and see those answers too. So uh, today the question and answer sessions are this, and um, it was a moment filled with a lot of learning and inputs. So thank you everyone, every one present here for such a wonderful session, being active and answering everything and making our confusion clear. I am really um, thankful to the learning session here. And now I like to hand over this uh, virtual platform to Dr. Asis. It is um, uh, today we are going. It is a proud moment for NESS as we are going to launch our second EMAG, and our very energetic um, oculoplastic surgeon, Dr. Asis, is leading it. So I will like to end it here and hand it over to Dr. Asis. Thank you, Dr. Dixia. I, Dr. Asis Rajpant, editor of Nessus Imag, and the whole Nessus Imag editorial committee, would like to thank the Nessus Executive Committee first of all for entrusting us with the responsibility of biannual official publication of Nepali Society of Oculoplasty Surgeons. I am joined by Dr. Hom Bahadur Guru, editor of Nessus Imag. for the occasion and it is our great pleasure to bring forward to you the second issue of the nessus simag as you can see in the screen shared the theme for this issue is the wayward eyelids the oxford learners dictionary defines wayward as a difficult to control 
Thus, a wayward eyelid signifies a dystopic eyelid, which is difficult to control unless an appropriate intervention is performed by the oculoplastic surgeons. This issue is thus focused on the common eyelid conditions such as entropion, ectropion, and blepharoptosis, which is consistent with the theme of the uh, webinar that is eyelid malpositions. This issue is our effort to make it a fun to read e-magazine and not just pages of information. Apart from the review articles, opinions, and tips and tricks, we have continued the interview section. This time we have interviewed one of the globally renowned pioneer of oculoplasty surgery from Nepal, Dr. Naresh Joshi. We have also started an oculoplasty update section where we have reviewed some impactful articles published in the last six months in major oculoplasty and ocular oncology journals. We have also started a section video bouquet where we have provided links for the oculoplasty videos of surgeries performed by the members of NESOS. And we have also continued providing an update on activities conducted by NESOS as it is the official publication of NESUS, while oculoplastic photo stories have been covered through the eye stories. The objective behind the introduction of the EMAG is to provide an ideal forum for exchange of information on oculoplasty through research papers, reviews, and case studies or series, whilst retaining its character as an e-magazine with news, stories, photos, and event coverages. We hope we are able to deliver that and promise to keep continuing the same in the days ahead. We would like to thank the sponsors of the second issue of Nesos Imac, Boishno Medicines, Biomed, Nepal Pharmaceuticals Limited, Jyoti Eye Hospital, and Itari Global Eye Hospital for their invaluable contribution. We appreciate the supports of all the members of the Nesos Executive Committee and our esteemed authors. Feedbacks and suggestions are always welcome, and you can contact us at nesosimac@gmail.com. Hope you have a joyful reading. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asis. Uh, now we are on the verge of conclusion. Uh, I would like to invite Secretary of Nations, Dr. Ranjana Sharma, to conclude with a vote of thanks. Thank, thank you, Dr. Devras. Uh, respected uh, national and international uh, uh, panelist, speaker, and all the participants, very good evening. I myself, Dr. Ranjana Sharma, very much pleased to express a vote of thank on behalf of organizing team. My heart feels with a lot of gratitude to our respected, distinguished international speakers, especially Professor Dr. Tayab Akpani, Professor Dr. Abjit Kaur, Dr. Uh, Urjan Tepo, and all our national speakers for not only giving your valuable time to today's webinar, but also sharing your knowledge on various topics of, on eyelid disorders. We are thankful for clearing our knowledge and enhancing our concept in oculoplasty. I'm sorry for my voice. I'm thankful to all the respected international and national panelists for accepting our invitation, participating in today's webinar and adding your valuable comments on various topics. Without your presence, we could not have accomplished what we are dreaming for. I would like to thank all the executive team members for the dedication and enthusiasm in organizing this webinar. This webinar would have been impossible without the effort of Dr. Sulakshmi Patwal, the scientific chair, Dr. Suresh Rasaili, scientific secretary who worked a lot uh, to make this um, session successful, scientific coordinator, Dr. Suresh Raspant and Professor Dr. Ilyas Shrestha, webinar coordinator, Dr. Binita Bhatrai, CPT coordinator, Dr. Lakshmi Devi Manander, who worked continuously devoting their precious time and dedication. They are the main backbone of this event and I have heartfelt gratitude towards them. Congratulations all of you for this successful event. I would like to thank co-organizer Rapti Eye Hospital, the sponsor Allegron Pharmaceutical Company for sponsoring today's webinar. Very special thanks to our IT team, Dynamic EMR, Mr. Somsa, for a smooth technical support. My special thanks goes to Dr. Devras Parati and Dick Habista, who uh, conducted today's webinar very smoothly. Congratulations. I'm thankful to executive members of NASO's editorial committee of EMAC for being successful in publishing our second issue. Special thanks to Dr. Hombadir Guru and Asis Rajpant, who worked day and night to make this up, uh, to publish this EMAC. Congratulations for your hard work. 
Last but not the least, I'd like to thank all the participants, all the members of NASOS, members of NOS, being patient and listening and contributing your valuable questions and feedback in today's session. Thank you all. Good night. My, I want to hand over this mic to Dr. Devras. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now uh, it's the time for a photo shoot. Then I would like to request all the um, participants to open up their videos and give a very sweet smile. And Somji with Somji with a snapshot. Yeah. Very less video. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are we done now? Yeah. No. Uh, thank you so much, Somji. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you all. And here we uh, conclude today's webinar uh, successfully. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, especially uh, our international speakers, uh, Professor uh, Abjit, uh, Professor Afghani, and then mm -hmm. also uh, Purjanda Tepo from Indonesia. Thank you very much. It was great learning from all of you. Thank you. And good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.